So we'll jump into the life story part now. My life story. I've been waiting for this. This is awesome. Yay. I guess start with like when I was really young. Um, well, it's easy. Um, I grew up, well, I started in a place called Farmer's Branch, which is actually like a, a place in Dallas. Um, it's like a suburb, but I was going to say subsidiary, but I had too much business thought, thoughts going on. But, you know, I actually, my dad brought home an Apple IIe. We've created the IIe. The same old II, but implemented with 1983 technology. And uh, I was just, I was completely in love with it. Um, we put it in the kitchen, and he just couldn't get me off of it. Um, and they had very few games out for it, um, when, it when, when I got it. So um, I actually started to make my own games, and I programmed in BASIC, and then um, learned like assembly language, and was basically teaching myself stuff. Um, this was about second or third grade. I just loved the fact that you could take something, program it in, and then the story would come out the other side. So, like, the first game I programmed was, uh, I called it Snow Wars, and it was basically, like, um, kindergartners going and grabbing snowballs, and then you had to stock up on your snowballs and icicles and other thing components of the first of the game, and then later on you'd go and you have a fight, and there'd be a random number generator, and um, had a decent kind of combat system in it. So, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, I, was, I always loved computers and games. And then I started to play, like I loved RPGs, so um, loved the Ultima series, um, loved Bard's Tale. Basically, any game I get a, my hands on, I would play. Um, and my dad wasn't super supportive of, of uh, games, so like he didn't give me money to get them. So I was like one of those brats that was like always at Babbage's and literally like buying games and then I would go and um, return them and they'd have my name down as a person that was like <laughs> to watch out for because you know I just had such a thirst to play the games and so little money to actually buy them. Um, and so I, I found all sorts of ways, ways to copy the copy protection and like you know photocopy stuff and um, take pictures of things and then um, you know, basically using all the disk utilities to break the copy protection. So, so now it's kind of hard because I know business-wise, I always get mad about people ripping stuff off, and I have to remind myself of when I had no money and you know wanted to play all these great games. Um, it was actually after a while, I actually took my first job at Babbage's, and I was like, hey, why don't I just figure a way to make this line up? And so when I was 14, I was at Babbage's, and I would go and. You know, we we use the shrink wrap machine basically to play the games, and then shrink wrap them back and put them on the shelf. So um, that was pretty awesome. But um, yeah, those were that was amazing. I remember like actually playing games, and then NES came into could play, and you know everybody was like enjoying playing the NES. This boy is doing more than just playing a video game. He has entered another world, a world of danger, intrigue, and magic. This is the world of the Super Mario Brothers. Put it on the screen, and where there was one kid, you'll soon find two, or three, or more. I was like fourth, fifth grade, I think. Um, and I knew a lot about games. Um, I think Metroid came out right around there. That's kind of the, the Justin Bailey came, book code came out. I think that was actually sixth grade that came out. And it made me like a legend. I was like, at school, I was the cool guy. Um, and then like seventh and eighth grade happened and then people started getting getting like interested in, in girls and interested in sports and all of a sudden games weren't as cool anymore. But for me, games were cool. And so I started my, my, my uh, drop from being that cool guy to the guy that was the nerdy guy still involved with, with games. Um, so, but, but I loved them. And I remember like I had like this weird hat box that was like, it was like a, some kind of baby blue it was awful, like a 50s thing that you would, uh, you would basically like use the zipper and zip up. And I remember taking that, and the games I really loved, I would buy, and I'd put put them in there. I actually, I actually didn't play Tim's games um, just because I didn't know about them. I remember there was like it was almost like Star Trek and Star Wars. It was like people would be either into Sierra or into um, into into like the Lucas Arts games, um, and you know I was on the Sierra side. Um, 
Um, Is that the Star Trek or the Star Wars side? <laughs> I don't know which one to say. Um, but anyway, like I, I remember, like once I actually, uh, once I grew up and like graduated college and stuff, I you know I started getting the finance, and my dad was in economics, and um, I took a took a job and basically got into finance because I was like, hey, money's great, making money is a good thing. And I remember going through this this uh, stage when I was in Boston, and I was like, I've got to grow up, and like it's probably one of the saddest days of my life. Is like. I took that that this blue box, which I'd taken with me everywhere, and like I had moved probably like 20 times um, when I was a kid, and it just went everywhere. And I was always in under my bed, and it was the one thing I just opened up and went through the opened it up, go through the manuals, and look look at the game, reread the back, just like I loved that that ritual of doing it. And I remember thinking to myself, like probably because I was trying to get married or find a girl, but um, I was like, I've got to grow up, and. I took them outside, opened it up, and then dumped everything in the, in the dumpster. Um, and I felt pretty good about that for two years. And then, like now, like, oh, I'm crushed. I cannot believe I did that. And like, I've even go on eBay every once in a while and just check it out. I'm like, how much do those games cost? So I can actually reassemble like my old collection. If your parents weren't super supportive of the whole game thing, I mean, you're doing programming at a young age. Yeah. Did you give up on that? Yeah, um, that's another regret. Like I think I have is that uh, you know my dad didn't think that programming was the way to go. He was a very like he was a colonel in the air force and hospital administrator and I mean very successful business guy. Get the lead, Justin! Um, and he was always he wanted me to go do like be part of the Air Force and join it. I even got, I, I got in the Naval Academy um, and I turned it down. Um, finally, at some point in my life, I like literally had this, this thing with my dad where I was finally like, you know, this is my life. I've got to, I've got to live it. And I'm not living it for you. You know, I'm living it for me. And I don't want to be a part of the Air Force. Um, or, sorry, Navy or whatever it was. He wanted me to just go in the Armed Forces. He like, pick one. So I won that. But, you know, I think the business side of things um, had just grown on me. And so I, I had done the business side. I probably regret not having just kept with the game development. Um, but I remember that time, I just didn't, I didn't know if it was viable. I didn't know if it was something that could be viable. Um, but yeah, I kind of wonder, like, what would have been different if I had stayed with making games? Yeah, so I did, uh, you know, I was, I was offered a job working for... Uh, the Fed in New York. It was like the TAPS program, is a tre Treasury Audit Auction program. Um, and I remember turning it down. Like they, they offered me, I think it was like forty thousand dollars at the time, and they'd flown me out there. And everybody's like, "Man, you do this job for like two years, and you will have like you are in Goldman Sachs." Um, and and then I got another job offer in Boston, which was like a place called Pega Systems, and um, it was like a startup. And they're like, we'll give you options. <laughs> so I made the studio, and they're like, and we'll pay you forty-five thousand dollars. So I went to Boston, and uh, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't second guess that because I love where I where I've ended up. Um, but yeah, I, I went and did financial software, and um, you know, I, I I went to a bunch of places, went to conferences and things, and at one point, like I even, I, I did actually do some programming, um, and. Like I was in Delaware helping get like the first transactions, um, credit card transactions on the web. So up at that point when I was working, like you couldn't go on the web and get access to your credit card transaction history. And so um, my code is potentially still in there somewhere where it, it actually allows people to, uh, to look at their credit card transactions. Um, but I remember doing that work and looking at it and being like, you know, these numbers really don't mean anything. There's really nothing behind it, um, and just not being satisfied with it, you know, just all being about money. Um, but I was, you know, I was doing it for a while. Um, what ended up happening was like, um, so I don't know, if, uh, Jonathan Colton. So this is a song about uh, how it feels to write software for a living. It's called Code Monkey. So uh, I was listening to like NPR or something, and they're talking about a news story, and uh, I had gone along with my career and was continuing and. Um, Basically, what happened is, is Jonathan Colton was talking about how he just switched careers. Like he had a, a good money-making, you know, adult job, and then his daughter was born, and then he's like, you know, I'm gonna die someday. This, this, 
It just clicked in his head. He's like, my daughter is going to replace me. Uh, it was clear that I was running out of time, or maybe had already run out of time. I was 32. Uh, and it also seemed uh, very important to be brave and to set an example and to be the kind of person who made good decisions, the kinds of decisions that I would want my daughter to make. Uh, I did not want to be sad dad with unfulfilled dreams. That's, that seemed like a terrible way to go. And, uh, and then he's, he's like, I'm going to do what I love. Um, and decided to start doing video game music, basically, from, from there. I heard that story, and uh, you know, my daughter was like just born. Um, and I was like, you know what? I, I need to make this happen. You know, I need to do something in an industry I love and get back to what I, what I originally loved. Um, and the way I thought you know, that I could add, I, I could make that transition was to, uh, to basically potentially bridge the gap between business and, and games. Um, and then I got like a big break. Um, it was a huge break for me because uh, I, I got in the industry at Namco Bandai. Um, and you know, I, got, I got a job as like a, a corporate development guy. We we're supposed to like acquire another company. Um, during the time when I was working there though, the, the industry took one of its turns for the worst, one of its five year crashes. Um, and basically they were like, hey, why don't you just, just do green lights? Just do green light stuff. Um, and so I, I, I did, I basically ran the green light committee of like all the developers that were pitching projects um, in, into a publisher. And so I uh, got to run that process. It was done by committee. So we'd normally like take marketing and development and um, you know, a producer and take a bunch of other people. And then literally at the end, we'd all vote. And it had to be a unanimous vote basically to, uh, to pass through. There's a lot of fun things that were going on in Namco when I was there, but it was, uh, they were definitely in a rut of sequelitis. Um, and we were trying to get them out of that. Um, I actually, that was one of the most fun parts of my life is just like literally coming in and doing a, a, a job in an industry I loved. Um, but I do remember it being pretty sad at the end because um, we were told by management you know, to, to keep on taking meetings with developers but by the way, we're not signing anything for six months, um, and that just that was a sign for me that you know it was it was it was time to to, to look look elsewhere, um, and so yeah yeah I left uh, left Namco, and that's when I started seeing the stuff about you know Tim and Kickstarter and how successful we had come, and I was like, well, maybe that's another piece. So I was like, I know they have that. I don't know that space. I can learn it, but I can bring all this other you know knowledge about. Um, investments about how you invest in a company, um, distribution, how you do those rights, um, and then you know in a very like uh, I would say non risk adverse environment, Tim's willing to take 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 chances, um, and then hey maybe together you know we can figure out what what is kind of a future path um, where you can get games financed. So when you got here and you looked at the books or whatever and just sort of saw how things had been for like the past 10 years, like what was that like? Yeah, there's a missing piece. There's been a missing piece here for a while. Um, yeah, I mean the studio has, has succeeded in surviving for 14 years. Um, there have been some turbulent times, I think. I think everybody who's been here for that amount of time or even a part, portion of that know that. Um, but you know, also, the video game industry in general has gone through so much. I mean, I've heard the rumor that you know, the video game industry basically like destroys itself and recreates itself every five years, um, and it has like a small crash followed by a uh, big crash, and that like alternates. Um, and that's pretty true. Um, so if you look at that, you know, with a 14-year history, um, the way it's been timed out, Double Fine's been through like three of those, um, and still is here. Um, and it was very interesting to me to see like. You know, you look at people at EA and people at Microsoft and stuff, and you would see like the average amount of time that people actually spent, or or just take another publisher, the average amount of time that employees spend at those companies is actually less than Double Fine. So even though it doesn't seem like it, it's like Double Fine's been more a more stable place um, than a lot of those other companies. You know, it's his it's his company, it's Tim's company as far as uh, where he wants to take it, but. Um, you know, I think, I think interest-wise, he wants um, a healthy company and a healthy industry um, where creative people, you know, can thrive. Um, 
and it's kind of that's a, a big ideal that's kind of up here. Um, and how that gets done, you know, he's very open to uh, to you know hear proposals, and uh, that, that's all I do. I just go and I I'll make a proposal to him. And I'll I'll back it up with why I think you know it's a it's a reasonable assumption to make, and um, you know most of the time I, I I think he nods, and then we we explore that direction, and and that's something that really appeals to me about Tim is just. He's just not risk adverse. Um, he is willing to take chances and, and look at new things. And you know, he does that. He's very courageous on how he does that on the development side um, and, and being creative. And um, you know, I think that's the thing that's kind of been missing from Double Fine from before is uh, the person who wants to take those chances on the business side as well. I think it's, you know, this side is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I, I would just like honestly say that. it's. You know, it's really interesting that like you know you used to have like the business class and you know be be wined and dined. But I think one of the one of the things that's really interesting is that um, at least to me is like when you're on the the publishing side, like everybody's your best friend. Like all the developers love you. They laugh at your jokes. You get invited everywhere. It's really funny because the crash that happens the second you move over, like to the development side, is like you find out that like. Half of that was just bullshit, <laughs> and people were just pumping you up. And some guys never recover from that. Um, they just they're like, you know, it, it takes a huge blow to them. Like their ego never actually adjusts to the fact that they were just being kind of lifted up that whole time, um, and they're just like, well, something's wrong with the world, you know, because I am that cool of a guy. Um, for me, it was okay. I, I didn't I didn't mind it. Um, it was just like it was kind of cool because it's like okay, well, oh, there's th those are who your your friends really are, and those are the business partners you really need to you know try to continue to work with. So, um, but yeah, now I I, I I sit there in economy, my seat only goes back so far, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, you don't have a lot of the perks as the publishing side, um, but you know then you got to hang out with some amazing developers and you get to talk about video games and I got to play board games at lunch. Um, and like even games that like aren't even out there yet that people are thinking about kickstarting, and um, I would much much rather that I'd much rather be on that side um, than you know be in the stuffy business meeting and you know have the business class seats. So.